Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth in collaboration once again collaboration once again with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. Today we are doing something that Tom is not so much used to because he likes to prepare to his broadcast, he likes what's coming up, but you know, since he done all that what I'm what are we what we are going to do about today, it's, I guess it's no problem. It's just his memory have to, has to serve him right, because it's about 12 years ago that what he did. Because, as you know, I listen to uh, Tom's old recordings in the car, in the taxi, when I, when I drive taxi. And um, this morning I was listening to something I said, we have to put this one out in the Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda. R. W. Thompson in his book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, together with Tom's comment, is so up to date on what Thompson prophetically said in 1876 about the time even today. Uh, it's just incredible. But because I couldn't get a hold on Tom, he didn't prepare and listen to the MP3. So what we are doing today is just we are um, playing his old recording and whenever he jumps in and wants to add something, of course, and I pause the recording and he can add something live, and you are witnessing a wonderful, wonderful recording from the year 2012. Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. But first, let's hear the original <laughs> live today on the 22nd of April. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast. Yeah, nice to be here, Yerka. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, a little heads up for the listeners. Uh, I've suffered some uh, damage to my vocal cords, maybe from so many years of uh, doing these broadcasts that uh, uh, you'll be able to hear the difference between the sound of my voice in 2012 and where it is now. I'd like to apologize for that, but I am getting up in years and uh, my voice is suffering from it. But uh, And then also, I broke my headset and uh, it has a boom mic on it. And now I, I don't have my headset to position my microphone in front of my mouth the way it usually is. So I have to hold it by hand. And so if I move this microphone just a fraction of an inch, it'll change my audio. And I'll have to count on Yerk to uh, apprise me if my voice is tailing off and you can't hear me. and Or if it gets too loud, I have to adjust my uh my microphone, but I think I, I think I've got it so I can uh, uh, keep it in the same place all the time. I'll do the best I can, but uh, I'm anxious to hear this recording. Uh, the Papacy and the Civil Power is, well, one of the best books I've ever read on the subject of the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And uh, R. W. Thompson was supremely qualified. And uh, what, what I liked about uh, R.W. Thompson is that he was not a religionist. In other words, he was not an anti-Roman Catholic bigot. He was not a, a, a Protestant uh, in the sense that he was attacking the Roman Catholic Church. He was just simply objectively assessing the Roman Catholic Church from history and from current events. And... Uh, so it, it was a very objective analysis and a very thorough, extensive analysis of the Roman Catholic Church, too. And uh, it, it, I just had to read that book and discuss it. And so I did 12 years ago on uh, Inquisition Update. So uh, I'm anxious to get started and see where we go with this. All right. Thanks, Jerk. Okay, Tom. Now, uh what we are going to hear is uh, the start of the reading of page 226, The Papacy and the Civil Power, Chapter 8. I hope, Tom, that you are able to see uh, the PDF I have here on my screen. Otherwise, I send you the PDF so that you can maybe uh, open the one on your computer and read better in bigger letters. But this is as big as I can put it here. Oh, no, this is fine. This, this is, fine. is fine. Okay. Uh, the recording is here on the top and you see it starts at 20 seconds. So this is just um, the old ragged cross plate that you have already in the intro anyway. So we're going to take that out and it is uh, starting with Tom's inauguration of the broadcast. Uh, that was somewhere, if I'm not mistaken, between October and December or something in 2012. So about 12 years ago today where we are in April 2024. 
but it is absolutely up to date and I hope you will enjoy it. He just starts on chapter 8. I know that he is reading about at least 5 to 6 pages and sometimes, for me at least in the car, it is very difficult to see whether he is reading from the book or he is commenting because, as he said, R.W. Thompson is so thoroughly going through this and even in this quote-unquote objective way um, that sometimes I cannot tell is Tom now commenting or is he reading from the book. Anyway, we will start here. He will tell us what the chapter is all about and I really advise you to listen because this is uh, spot on on the Roman Catholic Socialist agenda and it is spot on on all the things that are going on today about 150 years after R.W. Thompson wrote that book. And here we go. Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Now we're going to continue hear, with I The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Thank you, pardon? I don't hear anything. The audio oh. went away. Okay, yeah, that's, um, sorry for that, my dear listeners of this video, that is always the problem with Skype, we start the recording, I share the screen and I share the sound, I do a sound test with Tom, he says everything's alright, then we're going to go to the actual work, and all of a sudden the sound is gone, so, uh, do you see my screen again? Yes, I see the screen. Okay, let's just go back to 20 seconds and start and let me know if you hear it now. Good morning. Yes, Welcome to Inquisition Fine. Update. Okay. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in Believe this it or morning. Not, now we're going to continue with The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Last time we... Yeah, it is. <laughs> so familiar, Tom, because I listen to it every day. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have my voice back. <sighs> Well, uh, you know, Tom, there was lately this one comment on the videos that you are shouting and, and, and uh, doing uh, inappropriate loud comments and all that. And you, that's what yeah. changed your voice, you know. You were shouting yeah. too much. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> that's okay. Now, let's go on. Introduced chapter 8 of the book, and in this chapter we're going to discuss the infallibility of the Pope before the decree of papal infallibility of 1870. If this sounds confusing, we'll get to it and explain everything. And we're going to talk about the Pope's temporal power, not divine. That is, the kingly authority of the Pope, the power to persecute, the power as a ruler, a dictator, was not divinely given to the papacy. And now and then we're going to talk about the Italian people, particularly those of the papal states and how they lived under papal domination. We're going to talk about the government of the papal states, the jet and we're going to talk about Jesuitism. It's very important to our understanding of the papacy today is to understand Jesuitism because it is Jesuitism that controls the papacy. We're going to talk about mutilation of books that has historically been the jurisdiction of the papacy to destroy books that run counter to the teaching of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to talk about union of church and state by Constantine. Remember the Constantinian ruler of Rome, the Roman Empire who united the church and the state and gave authority to the church. Uh, we're going to talk about his grant of supposition, uh, suppositious, <laughs> word I can't pronounce, suppositions, I'll just put it that way. I think we're going to talk about the, uh, the donation of Constantine. In other words, the very foundation of the temporal authority of the papacy. We're going to show how it's a human invention and not a divine invention. And speaking again of Constantine, he, said, he says he did not unite the Church of Rome. And Rome was governed by imperial offers, officers, and the apostles had no temporal power. Okay, a hodgepodge of subjects in this book, but I'm sure, or in this chapter of the book, but I'm sure that if you'll listen carefully, 
you'll be able to assimilate it all and make sense of it. And most importantly, the goal of the listener of Inquisition Update should be to recognize what is being said in this book and examine the current state of affairs in the world to see if anything has changed or if the new world order really is the reestablishment of the old world order. That's the thesis of this book. Now, beginning at the top of page 226, if you're following along, it says, It was asserted by Protestants generally, before the decree of papal infallibility was passed, that if that doctrine could ever obtain the approval of a general council of the Roman Catholic Church, it would be employed to advance the favorite theory of the Jesuits that the spiritual power of the Pope also includes the temporal as one of its necessary incidents, inasmuch as it belongs to the primacy of Peter and was divinely conferred upon him. Okay, the, the assertion is that the Jesuits are the ones who believe that Peter was given not only some spiritual authority as, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, but that he was given kingly authority. In other words, he had the power of civil government also in his jurisdiction. That they call the primacy of Peter. And the papacy, is, uh, uh, through Jesuit influence, asserts that same uh, ecclesiastical and civil authority on the pope who is believed in the Roman Catholic Church to be a successor of Peter by divine right. All right, the Jesuits themselves practiced no duplicity upon this question, but openly asserted their doctrine with a confidence which would now seem to have been awakened by a perfect knowledge of their power over all the authorities of the Church, including the Pope. All right, R. W. Thompson makes the assertion that the Jesuits exert their authority both over the Roman Catholic Church and over the papacy. The uh, well-trained rowers, as uh, R. W. Thompson has described him, described them elsewhere. In other words, they are leading the Pope to world domination. And occasionally they have to rein in the papacy and get it back on track. The leaders of the it Roman Catholic Church are the Jesuit order, and the papacy here. takes it. Yeah, uh, please talk. I, I, yeah, I want to explain. When, when uh, before or at the time the Jesuits were established in 1534 in their in that era. The papacy was in shambles. Uh, there was so much corruption, even within the papacy, within the ecclesiastical orders, the orders of monks and nuns. The church had enjoyed so much autonomous power and authority and riches and wealth that it became wholly corrupt, completely corrupted. And uh, the Jesuits blamed all of this corruption uh, as resulting in the Protestant Reformation. And that in order to defeat Protestantism, the Roman Catholic Church had to be, well, it had to clean its own house. And the Jesuits took it upon themselves to clean up the Roman Catholic Church. And it <clears throat> condemned all the ecclesiastical orders, the Franciscans, the the, the Gregorians, the on and on and on, and uh, reorganized all of them to eliminate the corruption and then put the papacy on notice that the papacy was largely responsible for the Protestant Reformation, the, uh, the exodus of so many Catholics out of the Roman Catholic Church in protest and that the papacy was being called the Antichrist because of its corruption. And so the Jesuits, 
asserted themselves as the savior of the church. And they were not only going to save the church, but they were going to save the papacy from all the damage done, from all the corruption and the untold wealth and power. And uh, they were going to take the, the reins of the church completely under their control. And they were going to control the papacy. And uh, the illusion is made uh, in this, uh, this audio that the Jesuits became the rowers of the papal bark. Okay, you know what a bark is? It's a ship. And the Jesuits were going to be the rowers of the papal ship. The ship of church and the ship of the papacy. The, the Jesuits were going to steer the boat. They were going to row the boat. And they were going to be the power and the, and the driving force behind the church. And they have been ever since. And uh, they're the ones who drove the papal bark uh, to the First Vatican Council of 1870, where they declared the papacy divine and infallible. It became a, dog, a dogma of the Roman Catholic Church that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he speaks without error. He is if it were God on earth, and he speaks infallibly. And, uh, of course, uh, we know this to be one of the very signs of the Antichrist. And uh, anyway, uh, so I just wanted to explain where we get this rowing of the papal bark by the Jesuits. They're now in control. They've been in control ever since the Council of Trent in 1535, 1565, so many years that the, the Council of Trent was convening. And uh, they've been in control ever since. They drive the Roman Catholic Church in all of its directions. They drive the papacy, and now they've even got one of their own as, 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 a, as a pope. Uh, Francis I is a Jesuit. So... Uh, I, I thought maybe it was necessary to do a little explanation there so the listeners can comprehend what, what R.W. Thompson is talking about. Okay, back to you, Yurt. How would you like it, Tom, if I sustain everything you said by written word of the papacy itself right here, right now? Very well. There is a papal bull that few people know. That paper bull has a name and it is called Injunctum Nobis or Injunctum Nobis or however you want to pronounce that in English. Uh, this is a little um, excerpt from that bull. And that bull was uh, published 1542 or 1543. So even two or three years before the Council of Trent that Tom just mentioned. Forgive me that I do not know the... the uh, perfect year of publication you can look that up for yourself but i tell you when you go to wikipedia or any other page that officially lists all the papal bulls this bull you will not find in there from the book from uh, karl theodor griesinger a german who wrote a book on the history of the jesuits from the moment of their foundation in 1534 until the moment of publishing his book 1866 or 1872, the second book, because he wrote two volumes, uh, this is taken from. And he uh, writes this on page... Um, uh, no, this is the Injunctum Nobis, uh, yeah, the, the English book on page 81. He says here, quote, the general of the order, so we are speaking of the general of the Jesuit order, at that time, of course, Ignatius of Loyola, as soon as he is nominated, shall have complete power as to the government of the society and especially also over the whole members of the same, wheresoever these latter may reside and with whatsoever office or dignity they may be endowed. His power shall be indeed, uh, shall indeed be so unlimited that should be deemed it necessary for the honor of God, he shall even be able to send back or in other directions those who have come direct from the popes. 
Now, this is not exactly the same thing that it says in my German part. I also have a German copy of this because I read the book in German on YouTube. And uh, let me just go to the German part here. And this is, and of course, in Germany, uh, in, in German. So you can uh, see this. this is a very old German writing. Yeah, It is called Frakturschrift. And it says here... Um, that uh, the papers uh, that uh, the Jesuits were empowered to that as well as Loyola as any other future or general of the order uh, Ordens General general of the order uh, under the uh, under getting the um, uh, the council of the f uh, most um, prestigious society, but for the rest, completely after his own will, may change the laws of the order, means the Jesuit order, yeah, may change the laws of the order, the Gesetze, as it, uh, as it says here, Gesetze, that's the laws, respectively can take them away or can add something to them, to these laws, or he can create them completely new, yeah, kreieren, create. Um, anyway, in the way that he thinks that it is uh, necessary because of the circumstances to be advantages for the order, and that these changes or new created constitutions, even in a case if the Roman, if, if the Holy Chair has no knowledge of it, has the same validity validity as if the Pope has um, confirmed it. Solche steht wörtlich in der Bulle in Junctum Nobis. So this is wörtlich in the uh, in the Bull in Junctum Nobis. So in the English translation you have a little bit different thing. That's what I showed to you first. But this is the German text, and this German text says clearly that. The Pope gives power to the general of the order of the Jesuits, not only after his own will to change the laws or add to the laws or even create completely new laws. And he does that with the allowance of the Pope without even the Pope being informed about it. So this means that in 1542 or 1543, whatever that year was that uh, this uh, bull came out, I can read that in the book uh, Griesinger, you can read that for yourself in the book. Um, that's, by the way, on my archive uh, page to be found in English. So that means that with this bull, the general of the uh, Society of Jesus got a complete, as we call it, carte blanche complete freedom, complete power over the Roman Catholic Church, over the Pope and over the Jesuit order, and he can reign at his own will. He can add to laws existing, he can take away laws existing in the Constitution, he can even uh, get rid of the complete Constitution and put out a completely new even if the Roman, uh, if the Holy Chair, if, if uh, Rome, the Pope, doesn't have any knowledge of it, it has the same validity as if the Pope would have confirmed that. This is word for word out of the bull in Junctum Nobis. Tom, what do you say about that? Well, it's the same as saying from here on out, the Pope was put on notice that if the church was going to be saved, if the papacy itself was going to be saved, and if the papacy was ever to be elevated to global ruler status, as has always been the design of the Roman Catholic Church, that the papacy had to submit to the, to the Jesuits because the Jesuits were supremely qualified both to uh, route out the corruption of the church, but also to guide the church and the papacy to global supremacy. That's as, a, king of ki as king of kings and lord of lords. 
Yeah. And if the Jesuits decided to do something, even without the Pope's knowledge, it was in their prerogative to do so. So you can see that they've they've effectively reduced the papacy to a hand puppet. Yeah. To literally a figurehead. Right. And a, a public image, but the Jesuits are the power behind the power of the throne in Rome. So my, back to you. My point was just, Tom, that here you have it in writ in a papal bull, which is the yeah. highest authority a pope written can publish. And we have now the understanding of the Jesuit motto, which is the church to rule the people the Pope to rule the church and the Jesuits to rule the Pope. That's right. And here you have it in writ in a papal bull from 1542, 1543 in Junctum Nobis. I'm, I, I can open my browser now and I can look at it and I'm going to show to you that it is not easy to be found. Um, I did that before. In Junctum no, well, Nobis Papal bull. Let's see if it shows up. Well, here, this is in French. In Junctum Nobis in Wikipedia. And what does it say? Not much. Eh? Uh, but it's uh, 15... Uh, uh, bull Pontifical, Pope Paul III. He is the one who ordained the Jesuit order in 1542. And it says here 1544 in Junctum Nobis. So when I click on this, you see it is not easy to get all the information, uh, especially the text. Um, but um, I, I think the more you look for it, the more you can find that. Um, Philip Sheff probably also put that in his book, in Junctum Nobis, I see here. Uh, he said here, from the Bulls, uh, November 13, 1564, that would be at the end of the Council of Trent. But uh, Griesinger said that in the beginning of, and here you have World, New World Encyclopedia, Papal Bulls, um, list of Papal Bulls. This is the one uh, most frequented. And when you have a look at this, uh, yeah, I just accept all the cookies, otherwise we are no, we're getting nowhere. So we are going into the 16th century. And then you have here, uh, 1543 in Jungtum Nobis, you have it here, but you have no content. You see, here on the last uh, part of this uh, of this tablet, they always say what it's about. Yeah, like 1521, uh, Leo X uh, gives the uh, um, decree, um, Exurge Domine, here, that excommunicates Martin Luther. Uh, and all the other things, but here you have no of nothing of the content. And here you have 1550, Exposit Debitum, second and final approval of the Society of Jesus. Maybe also something interesting to look at and, and read. Because that's what Tom and I want you to do. Do your own research. But you see, you see here in Junctum Nobis, and it has no content here. You don't know what's it about. Um, just when you look it up on the internet, it is not easy to be found. Um, Uh, this is just papers of papal bulls. It's not even uh, in Junctum Nobis. So that's that's my point. You have to do your own research in that regard. That is very, very important. Because when you do your own research, you also own the information. You just haven't heard it somewhere. You have just not saw seen it somewhere or whatever. No, you studied it with your own mind. And that gives you a kind of knowledge that gives you a kind of wisdom that the Bible proposes that you should have, as you should study the Bible and by that get the wisdom and the knowledge of God and his character. Like in the world, when you study these things and measure them at the Bible and measure, okay, I have to study the Jesuit order, not because they're in the Bible, but because they are the task force, soldiers, foot people of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I have to study those, then you have to do that and, and, and go into that. And that's why I absolutely propose read these books, read Griesinger's books, uh, Griesinger's book on uh, on the Society of Jesus. Uh, I mean, uh, I can, 
I can show you the book. I have it here, and I think it is on my archive. It is here, The Jesuits' Complete History uh, by uh, Griesinger, Complete History of the, of the Jesuit Order. Scrolling down a little bit, it's 850 pages because it's two volumes. He, in English, he wrote volume one and two, History of the Jesuits. And what did the picture say? I think it was page 161 or something. Let's just go there and see if we can go to the page of uh, where I copied that from, from the Bull in Junctum Nobis. Let's just go there. Tom, I think that's okay with you, that we're going to do a little on online research here. Yes. Yeah. The powerful influence of the Jesuits, it says here, and then on page 161. Um, let me just see if that was page 161. Uh, oh, no, page, 80, uh, page 63, 81 in the PDF count. Okay, but that's German. Okay, let's see the English one. Um, the English photo was here. Oh, come on, this mouse. I'm, I'm going to kill that mouse someday. I especially bought one with a wire and still it's not going well. Uh, page 81. Okay, so I'm a little bit far on. Of course, it's in the beginning. Page 81. Let's see. Um, page 81. That's probably in the German book or what? No, this is the English book. English. Uh, okay, the general of the order. Let's just search this. I, I want to show you how you have to do research, of course. It says here, as soon as he is. So let's just look that up in the book, which is the original text from here. If I have the right book, of course, you know, <clears throat> different uh, versions of the book are probably to be found on the Internet. And when he has to say search 850 pages, it's going to take a moment. As soon as he is nominated, it must say. So. I think this is too important to just go over that because, you know, when Tom uh, in this broadcast 12 years ago or today in the broadcast tells you things about this and this is what the Jesuits actually are for, you can say, yeah, Tom is saying that. Uh, but when we prove that by this papal bull out of the horse's mouth itself, I think it is much more valid even uh, here. Uh, here it is on this page. You see, it is uh, page 67 in the book here. So, uh, where he is going on the bull, probably the page before, um, or here. I have already spoken of the privileges which the Pope granted to the order even in the first year of its existence. So that's already 1541 then. Huh? But what did these prerogatives signify compared with those with Paul III conceded to the Society of Jesus on October 18th, 1549? One would indeed be perfectly correct in calling the bull which refers to them the Magna Carta of the Jesuits, and they themselves admitted as much when they conceived such a designation for his decree as the great sea of their privileges. If one should inquire what could have been the reasons which actuated the Pope in bestowing such conspicuous favors on the new order, they are to be found in the preamble of the bull, which terms the society a fruitful acre, which, effecting much for the increase of the kingdom of God and the faith, that is to say, the exaltation of the papacy and the suppression of heresy, through instruction and example, therefore well deserves to be rewarded with special favors. And, in fact, favors of quite a peculiar description were given them, as the reader will sufficiently understand from the following extracts. So then comes what I read to you already. Uh, then it continues to say, thus from this paragraph, his own power is placed over that of the Pope. So the general of the Society of Jesus' power is placed over that of the Pope. How does it fare then with the four vows? Quote, 
no general without the consent of the general convention and no member of the society without the express consent of the general shall accept a bishopric, archbishopric or any similar dignity and whoever may have attempted in any way to obtain any such place shall be considered so unworthy of the society of Jesus that he shall never more be employed in any important commission, office or business. Uh, what does that to the office of the Pope today? who is a Jesuit, as you uh, probably know. Yeah. So um, it says here also, and this is the footnote of the first paragraph that we read. Uh, let's just go in the footnote. It says, in this first paragraph, there is also a question regarding the deposition to the general, which could be pronounced by a general chapter uh, of professed members whenever he could be proved guilty of heresy or of leading a life of vice or was useless on account of mental derangement etc. But as long as society existed there never was an instance of a general being charged before a general chapter and still less deposed. He might in fact do whatever he choose. I should like to see the person who would dare to bring an accusation against such a complete despot as was, and I add, still is, the general of the Society of Jesus. Well, I think that's enough for our little excursion into this, but I think we made the point very clear that it is not Tom who says that the Jesuits rule over the Pope, it is the Pope giving the Jesuits himself carte blanche to rule over him. I think we understood this from the reading that we were starting in to today. In a nutshell, it was, it was mutually understood by both the papacy and the Jesuit order that if the papacy was ever going to elevate itself to global supremacy, king of kings and lord of lords, they had to put the ship of church and the papacy in the hands of the Jesuit rowers. And, and uh, so the papacy had to subject itself to the Jesuits. If the church was going to survive, if the papacy was ever going to become king of kings and lord of lords, it had to re depend upon the military order of the Jesuits, the the special forces, uh, the special military forces of the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuits, to get the job done. And uh, that was decided uh, uh, at the time of the Protestant Reformation uh, and, the, uh, and the outflux of so many Roman Catholics who all of a sudden saw the church as the synagogue of Satan and as all, all of a sudden saw the papacy as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, that if this continued, the church and the papacy would be reduced to ashes. And so it took a special force, a special effort, a special group of men led by a very special general, and that's a military term, a general, to guide the ship of church and the ship of state to global supremacy. It was a matter of survival, and uh, it was a matter of destroying Protestantism so that the papacy could survive. And uh, the papacy had proved itself to be inept. The councils of the churches, uh, the council uh, uh, that the papacy was always at a war with, it proved it at inadequate, and uh, all the monkish orders were inadequate, and it, it was going to take a special effort to uh, clean up the church, destroy Protestantism, and then continue to elevate the papacy to the new world order, the new world order of the Pope. All right, back to you, York. It's okay, I lost the Jesuits. There this we become. Go clear as we continue in the book. Speaking again of the Jesuits, it says their boldness won them the victory, and they are now complete masters of the situation. All the energies of the Roman Catholic Church, insofar as the Pope is enabled to arouse them, are placed under their guidance. Okay, The Pope functions to keep the Church and himself 
under the guidance of the Jesuit order, and even the venerable pontiff himself is spending the close of a long and honorable life in endeavoring to establish the doctrine they have maintained so earnestly, that is, the Jesuits have maintained so earnestly as an essential and indispensable part of the true faith. All right, as the essential and indispensable part of the true faith, that is, Roman Catholicism, the Pope has temporal power, the power of a king. He's not just a preacher, okay? He's not just a bishop. He's not just over ecclesiastical things. He's not just the spiritual head of the Roman Catholic Church. He is a king. And the Jesuits make sure that he that his temporal authority, his kingly authority, is never diminished anywhere in the world. All right. The part of the the reason they they created this this uh, papal infallibility was to put all the emphasis on the Pope. Okay. If 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 it could be said by someone that the Roman Catholic Church at one time was not a popish church, that can no longer be said. Ever since the Council of Trent, when the Jesuit order was created, the papacy took primacy in the Roman Catholic Church, both as a priest and a king. Now, he continues, he says, with his vanity flattered, we're speaking about the Pope, with his vanity flattered by their caresses, by the Jesuits' caresses, and persuaded to believe that he stands in the place of God on earth, he omits no opportunity of declaring that he has been appointed by divine decree to direct and regulate all such secular affairs as pertain in any way to the Roman Catholic Church, its faith, its discipline, and the universality of its sovereignty." the universality of the sovereignty of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And it says, of those within the Roman Catholic Church who were unwilling to accept this doctrine, that is, papal primacy or papal infallibility, there were two classes. One, denying the infallibility of the Pope and claiming it only for the universal church, in other words, they didn't mind believing in infallibility, but they applied that infallibleness to the universal church. In other words, the Pope together with the, the councils, together with the, uh, the bishops. And it was kind of a, a group infallibility. When they all spoke with one voice, then they were considered to be infallible. Okay, they were willing to believe in the, in the infallibility of the universal church but they were unwilling to believe in the infallibility of the Pope, in other words, the primacy of the Pope, that all the infallibility of the Church was vested in the Pope, they did not believe. And it says, and the other, speaking of these two classes now, and the other insisting that if it were recognized, this, this papal infallibility, it would confer no temporal power upon the Pope because it was not necessarily included in the spiritual and had not been divinely established as an incidence of the primacy of Peter. So two classes of Roman Catholics stood out against papal infallibility. Those who believed that only infallibility existed in the universal church, a union of the Pope and of the bishops, and the other who recognized papal infallibility, but that it did not include the kingly power of the Pope. Okay? I hope that helps you make sense of this. Now, to this latter class, those who denied the Pope uh, temporal power, to this latter class, it may be fairly said, belonged a considerable port, portion, if not a majority, of the Roman Catholics of the United States. These had not yet felt the tremendous pressure of the Jesuit power and honestly endeavored by this argument to remove what they considered to be Protestant prejudice against their church. 
It was not composed entirely of laymen, but included some of the prelates and clergy who were not yet prepared to turn over the church to the Jesuit dominion. They could not see how it was possible if God had made the temporal the temporal power of the Pope an appendage to the spiritual power of the Pope that so many centuries would have elapsed without its announcement by the church in some authoritative form. And they were encouraged by this by the highest ecclesiastical authority in the United States. All right. Now we're going to outline a personage called Archbishop Kenrick of Baltimore, a very, very powerful Jesuit center in the United States. I want to make this perfectly understandable to the listeners. Let's all imagine, if you will, that Christ has returned. What position, what throne is he going to occupy? Well, he's going to occupy two thrones, okay? One as head of the church, okay, which is his divine right as, as, as God's only begotten son. And then also, uh, as far as temporal government, who's going to oppose him? He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. He's not going to be just a king over the kings of the earth. He's not going to be just a, a, a priest of priests. It's going to be the first time in world history a perfect union of church and state. There won't be two heads ruling. It'll be one head ruling over spiritual things, Christ, and over temporal things, Christ. He will have no equal. He will have no uh, co-partner in in government, except his father, of course. So if you'll understand that, then you also can understand that that is the very role that the papacy seeks on this earth as the replacement of the Son of God on earth. See, that's what vicar of Christ means. The official title of the papacy means vicar of Christ. It means the the replacement of Christ on earth. And this is exactly why the papacy demands to be king of kings and lord of lords. A perfect union of church and state. He's he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's the, the ultimate governmental authority, the ultimate civil authority, and the ultimate civil authority. He really is the Antichrist, okay? The counterfeit Christ. The one who puts himself in Christ's place. All right, and this is what R.W. Thompson is trying to ex- explain to you and describe for you. And that's why all of the efforts of the Jesuits are necessary to uh, counter both of these opposing forces that at the time of the adoption of the dogma called the infallibility of the Pope, the Jesuits were there to make sure nobody put any limitations on this infallibility that it belonged only to the Pope, just as infallibly, rightly, only, infallibility only rightly uh, belongs to Jesus, just as the civil power or the government of the world belongs solely to Jesus, it belongs to the Pope by the same power because he's the vicar of Christ, the, re- the replacement of Christ on earth. That's the purpose of the Jesuits in the world, to elevate the papacy to global civil and religious supremacy and that's what rw thompson is 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 explaining to you and describing to you and i only hope that my comments help you to understand what rw thompson is saying i'm neither trying to add to or take away what our rw thompson is telling you i'm just retelling it in other language so that you can better understand what he's saying all right back to you here Baltimore, Maryland, 
Archbishop Kenrick, who raised his voice against this papal infallibility. Now, before my listeners begin to think that this Archbishop Kenrick was genuine in his beliefs, I want to remind my listeners that the papacy often speaks out of both sides of its mouth. And it's necessary for the papacy to do this, especially when regarding the papal infallibility and the Pope's temporal power, that the, that someone within the Roman Catholic Church stand up to kind of, kind of, uh, squelch the, the, uh, well, in other words, they don't want to raise the suspicion of Protestants in this country. So they have to throw the Protestants a bone so as to alleviate their concerns. And this is what I believe the real intent of Archbishop Kenrick of Baltimore was. The author is preparing us for what we're about to hear by saying that there was a group, a very large group of Roman Catholics in this country who did not believe that the Pope, though he be infallible, had any temporal or kingly power. In other words, no power to control the government. All right. Now, in 1848, Archbishop Kenrick of Baltimore prepared for the press a treatise on the primacy of the papacy in which great learning and ability are displayed. It was published in that year, and a sixth revised edition was also published in 1867. When he comes to speak of the relations between the Pope and secular affairs, he begins his first chapter on the patrimony of Peter with this, emphasis, with this emphatic sentence, quote, The primacy, that is the primacy of the Pope, is essentially a spiritual office and has not of divine right any temporal appendage. In other words, when, we're, when, when Kenrick spoke or pretended to speak about the primacy of Peter he, or the primacy of the Pope, the Pope being the successor of Peter, it didn't include any kingly authority, only spiritual authority. Now, this is running directly counter to what the Jesuits are teaching. Now, I, I, remind my, my, I remind my listeners once again that this Archbishop Kenrick is from Baltimore, one of the most powerful Jesuit centers in this country. And I find it untenable that this Archbishop Kenrick, though he denies the temporal power of the Pope, denied it for any other purpose than to put down or to alleviate some of the Protestant concerns in this country. Okay, we don't want another Protestant Reformation taking place in the United States of America just when the Pope is claiming infallibility. All right? So you can take this as you please, but I still reserve the caution of uh, the teaching of this Archbishop Kenrick. I believe he's just as much Jesuit-influenced as is the Pope. And he's performing his function of trying to alleviate undue concern by Protestants. You know, put the Protestants back to sleep. But we in the background are going to continue to raise the Pope and increase his temporal power, even in the United States, even to the point of eventually overthrowing the Constitution and making America a Roman Catholic. Okay? So Kenrick is playing a very strategic role here. That's my assertion. You can, uh, you can read the book for yourself and see if you can come to a different conclusion. He quotes, he says, The primacy of the Pope is essentially a spiritual office and has not of divine right any temporal appendage. And, quote, The small principality in Italy, unquote, now he's talking about the papal states where the Pope was a king, and everybody knew he was a king over the papal states, not just a spiritual leader, but he was the king of kings and lord of lords over the papal states. 
It said the small principality in Italy, the papal states over which he is sovereign, he says, designated the patrimony of Peter on account of his having, uh, uh, account of its having been attached to the pontifical office through reverence to the prince of the apostles, unquote. So, what we're seeing is a doctrine that has been taught in the Roman Catholic Church called the, the Patrimony of St. Peter. That patrimony, or that which belonged to Peter, the temporal power was awarded to the Pope as his successor, and it only then included... Uh, the temporal power only extended over the papal states and not over anywhere else. Now, don't you find that a little bit ironic coming from uh, a Roman Catholic Archbishop of Baltimore? <laughs> but that's that's what he was preaching, that the, the, the temporal appendage or the patrimony of Peter, the temporal power of the Pope, was only valid in the papal states. That was the patrimony of Peter, according to this archbishop. And he declares that this, quote, has no necessary connection with the primacy, unquote. And because, quote, Catholics not living within the Roman states, within the, uh, the uh, papal states, are not subject to the civil authority of the pope, unquote. He treated of it no further than to trace its history. And to this we shall have occasion hereafter to refer. So, Archbishop Kenrick is putting down this, this concern. Oh, now we American Catholics don't need to get too riled up. The patrimony of Peter uh, was transferred to the Pope. Yes, indeed. And that's the Papal States where the Pope is the king. And uh, he's not to have any temporal power here in the United States. So we're an independent nation. Okay, we have our own government. Now, do you think the Jesuits are going to sit well with that idea? Not on your life. So Kenrick is just putting out fires. In other words, he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Personally, he truly believes in the temporal power of the Pope, the primacy of Peter, not over just the papal states, but the whole world. He's a, an archbishop from Baltimore, for heaven's sakes. Let's not forget that. Now, he says again, quote, and this is Archbishop Kenrick speaking, quote, In making uh, Peter the ruler of his kingdom, he, that is Christ, did not give him dominion or wealth or any of the appendages of royalty, unquote. Then going on to show that the Bishop of Rome was, was not yet a temporal sovereign at the time of Leo the Great, the middle of the 5th century, he says also at another place that the power of interfering with and regulating the political order in the nations was vested in the popes, quote, by the force of circumstances and was not a divine prerogative of their office. Unquote. Okay, that, let's comment here. Now, so what let's... Roman Catholic archbishop or bishop or priest? Yeah, let, let, let's comment here and make sure people understand. Uh, the papacy always has claimed that its patrimony, that is, that which belongs to Peter, is global. The whole earth. Now listen, the scripture says of God, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. Okay? What is the pope if he doesn't have the same patrimony. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. That's the new world order. When the papacy can say without opposition, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. That's the day and age we live in right now, and people are loath to recognize it, but that's where we're at. Okay? Just like the, the saying from 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 uh, Klaus Schwab, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. Why? Because God owns everything. 
the exactly, God of exactly to that point, Tom, you are coming later in this broadcast. Exactly oh. that point, because that's why it is so vital for the Roman Catholic Socialist agenda that I put this on. But it's good that you mentioned this already now. You know, this means people see that this is absolutely not scripted because you have not listened to it. And that's exactly what you say then. I mean, you don't speak of Schwab because, because it didn't exist in our minds in 2012. But uh, the spirit of that is exactly what you say in this broadcast. Well, now, now at least the listeners can see that Kenrick is just BSing everybody. He knows what the papacy is all about. He knows especially what the Jesuits are all about. To elevate the papacy to global godlike status in the world as king of kings, lord of lords, and his patrimony is the whole earth, nothing accepted. Okay? And Kenrick knows that just as well as the Jesuit general does, just as well as the papacy does, and, and they're just trying to keep the Protestants from coming unglued because they just fought a civil war to liberate this country from Protestant influence in, in Great Britain, and they were not about, I was, should, should have said, liberate the colonies from uh, 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 England English control, and they were not about to let the papacy come in here and rule over Roman Catholics and become a, a, a separate king in this country. With a, with a separate jurisdiction. Uh, look, a lot of blood had been shed in this country, and, the, and those who fought and died and their fa surviving families were not going to take any crap from the man of sin in Rome. And so the Catholics of this country had to be very careful what they said, had to be very careful what they did, at least publicly, but under the surface, they're all on, on board with this global supremacy of the Pope. The United States not accepted. It's going to come under papal control. The, the spiritual power of the Pope and the temporal power of the Pope, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords of the Pope, and nobody's going to have to have any objection to it. That's where we're at today. When the listeners don't understand this, but they will. That's where we're at today. The Pope is God in this country. And he's both, and not only that, but he's the civil power, too. And they're going to redistribute your goods, too. They're going to come into your house. They're going to assess everything you have. They're going to find out what you absolutely must ma re uh, maintain. And they're going to give everything else away to the needy. And you get to call it charity. Remember, Klaus Schwab said, you will own nothing and you'll be happy. That's what's coming. That's what's already facts on the ground in this world. And uh, uh, we're soon going to be believed, Yerk. That's a wonderful thing. That we're finally going to be believed when people see these things come to pass. All right. Thanks to R.W. Thompson, who saw all this coming. In the 1860s, God bless R. W. Thompson. I just wish, I just wish for all the world that the Protestants and the people of this country would have read uh, the papacy and the civil power and really understood what R. W. Thompson was saying. They'd have been light years ahead of this this pretender in Rome. All right, back to you, Yer. Yeah, Tom, maybe a few people will take the chance when I start uploading this on the Joglas War on this info channel later this year and uh, they see these recordings all there. I mean, this recording that we are doing now is all, already in the almost uh, in the end of the 50s and you are just on page 228 of uh, 768. So <laughs> it's, it's a quite a long reading, that book. I don't know how many parts. <laughs> Okay, let's continue with uh, Tom in 2012. East in the United States would repeat these words today. See again what the Pope says. Quote, The civil sovereignty of the Holy See has been given to the Roman Pontiff by a singular council of divine providence. And as regards the relation of the Church to the civil society, 
all the prerogatives and all the rights and authority necessary to governing the universal church have been received by us, the popes, in the person of the most blessed Peter, directly from God himself. Has the faith changed? Did not Archbishop Kenrick understand what it was? Was he a heretic? No. I don't believe he was a heretic at all. It's an interesting question, Tom, when you ask, was he a heretic? And I have, <laughs> I have a fitting answer to that for people who ask themselves, how come that uh, this archbishop is, quote-unquote, playing this role, as you mentioned it? Uh, I'm going to show you something. I think I have it on my archive in English. Um, it is the Oath of the Jesuits, the fourth oath of the Jesuits, the Oath of the Professed. Um, I, I know I have it in German here, uh, because I put that on, I, I don't even know if I have it in English. But anyway, um, no, I, don't, I don't find this right here. But the point is, when you read the Jesuit oath, and uh, Tom, you can, uh, of course, um, jump in here and uh, say it in better words if you can correct me here. Um, it says to the one who is taking the oath that he will work on one side and his Jesuit brother... Uh, openly on the on the other side but behind the curtains you work together and this archbishop kenrick is just taking a position of open uh, opposition to the papacy but behind the curtains under the covers he is working for the papacy he is just okay. helping advancing the grandfather clock that's right by pushing left, right, left, right, or right, wrong, or black, white, or whatever you want to call it. And this archbishop is ringing a bell for the quote-unquote Protestants, and they say, oh, he's right, he's right, so let's believe him. And what do you do? You, open, you run in the open arms of a Jesuit archbishop. And you didn't understand the game they are playing, that they play both sides only for the Goal ad maiorem e de gloriam, as they say, for the greater glory of God. What they don't tell you is that they don't mean Yahweh, they mean Satan. Right, Tom? They mean the Pope, which is just a mask for Satan. Yeah, just like Martin Luther said, the papacy is simply a mask behind which Satan resides. It's what it is. I mean, it's no, it's no calumniation to call the papacy the Antichrist. Oh, it's his he title. Is Vicar of Christ, Christ is his title. Vicar of Christ means anti. Anti doesn't mean That's against. It means in the place of. That's right. So, okay. <clears throat> Archbishop Kenrick was not a heretic. Archbishop Kenrick was perfectly playing his role he was assigned to by the Jesuit order. That's what he was. Well said. And all it was to do was to deceive the Protestants into relaxing and uh, just uh, go on about your Protestant business. There's nothing to see here. Right. Let's continue. Oh. No. I believe he was just speaking out of both sides of his mouth, just like I've asserted. And it says, but this, co this conflict of authority is in no other way important to us than to show how the honest apprehensions of Roman Catholics in the United States were allayed before the Pope's infallibility was announced and to excite to such inquiry as we'll, we will show in reality the temporal power was acquired whether it is of God or of man, whether it was obtained legitimately or by usurpation. This we shall be better prepared to understand the, the thus we shall be better prepared to understand the import of the issues which the papacy has precipitated upon us. They didn't want to lose the Catholics in this country that loved their government of by and for the people there were they were rightly concerned about how much power how much temporal power the pope might assert here in the united states and archbishop kendrick 
just simply went out with a bucket of water to cool them off a little while. And now we see the full-blown temporal power of the Pope in this country. Now, Archbishop Kenrick, this, uh, this Archbishop from the Jesuit hold of Baltimore, Maryland, is allaying fears in the uh, Roman Catholic population, the, the the largest of the two groups that believed in infallibility, but that that didn't include any kingly power. The Pope was infallible when he spoke on matters of faith and morals, but he was not infallible when he exercised his authority as a king, as he did in the Papal States. They did not want in this country the kind of servitude, the kind of tyranny and oppression that was suffered in the Papal States by the, by the subjects of the Pope, where the Pope ruled supreme as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They were genuinely concerned about the Pope's uh, temporal power being extended here in the country, and Archbishop Kenrick's out putting out fires. Okay, Archbishop Kenrick did not consider it necessary in his work on the primacy to treat of the Pope's temporal power in Rome any further than to trace its history. Nor was it necessary that he should do so in view of his denial of its divine origin. He did not consider it to be a part of the faith of the Church that he or anybody else should believe that it was conferred by Christ upon Peter and had come down through an unbroken line of succession to the present Pope. The new order of things, however, the introduction of the new faith, gives great importance to the question. Because if it be true that the temporal power of the Pope anywhere is of divine origin, then the new faith is right, and the old faith is wrong and the world may be may reasonably expect that either by its own consent or by the providence of god it may yet be compelled to admit to its universality if on the other hand it had the origins of fraud usurpation and imposture those of us to whom the charge of infidelity is now imputed may breathe more freely okay so if this temporal power of the Pope is truly by divine right, then we ought to repent, right? <laughs> but if, if, if it is, as I assert here at Inquisition Update, that it is a man-made institution, that Satan is behind it all, then we owe it no respect at all. That is the assertion of Inquisition Update. And those of us who assert that can breathe freely because we tell the truth. The infallibility of the Pope is a fraud. There is only one infallible in heaven and, and in earth. That is Christ. And the Pope is an imposter, a man-made substitution and a very cheap one at best. Okay, the papacy is antichrist. He presumes to replace Christ on the earth. And he most effectively does that by deceiving people into believing he's divinely inspired, a divinely appointed, and that he serves by divine right. Okay, these are all man-made institutions. Now, continuing, it says, Can it be possible that the Italian people violated the law of God by the act of terminating the Pope's temporal power in the Papal States? That's right. In the very time when the Pope was claiming himself universal power, both spiritually and temporally, a sort of global King of Kings and Lord of Lords, right there in the Papal States, where the Pope's power was supreme and unlimited, they were rebelling against it. There was rebellion against the papacy, against its cruelties. So, look at the contrast of what's going on. And it says, and uh, can it be possible that the Italian people violated the law of God by the act of terminating the Pope's temporal power in the Papal States? 
and that they have thereby cut themselves off from reasonable hopes of heaven unless they shall restore it? That's right. They were excommunicated. They were putting their own eternal destination in jeopardy by rebelling against this so-called patrimony of Peter in the papal states. Or were they justified, after the example of the United States, in throwing off the papal yoke and adopting a form of government which, although monarchical, is representative? If the former, if God did make Peter king of Rome and Pope Pius IX his successor in royal authority, then no such justification can exist. Revolution is offensive to God, and every government which has grown out of it must stand accursed at the bar of heaven. Arraigned as we are upon such a charge, both as principles and accessories, we must be allowed the privilege of the most abandoned criminal, the right to plead to the jurisdiction of his triers. It is a common remark of the supporters of the papacy that the civil government of Rome and the papal states by the Pope and his curia was altogether paternal, that it looked carefully after the interests of the people, was most considerate of their happiness, and was in fact one of the best governments in the world. If this were true, it is not easy, according to any ordinary rules of reasoning, to account for the fact that Pope Pius IX has held the temporal scepter during all the years of his long pontificate by an exceedingly frail and uncertain tenure. To him as a king, there could be no strong personal objections. He's represented as a kind-hearted and benevolent, and no doubt truth, uh, truthfully so. Even Gavazzi concedes as much. But these very qualities may unfit him for the duties of government by subjecting him to the undue influence of men around him who play upon them, such as undoubtedly been the case. Antonelli, his cardinal secretary of state, is understood to be both ambitious and unscrupulous. Just such a man would, as would hold the curia and all the inferior offices of government in strict subordination to his will. He would, in all probability, have little difficulty in dictating the policy and measures of the administration. If the Pope has ambition, he would excite it. If he has none, he could create it. Thus we may account for their joint efforts to check the current, uh, the current of adverse circumstances which have, during the present pontificate, pressed upon the, pro the papacy and rendered it necessary that the Pope should be held upon his throne by French bayonets. Thus also we may account for the encyclical and syllabus and other papal bulls and briefs wherein the attempt is made to weld religion and politics together and make it appear that the people, however oppressed, have no more right to resist the divine right of kings than they have to, to violate the Ten Commandments. I just want to insert a little comment here on the sentence. Thus also may we account for the encyclical and syllabus and other papal bulls and briefs. Um, no, it's here, ah, the sentence before. Uh, during the present pontificate, pressed upon the papacy and rendered it necessary that the Pope should be held upon his throne by French bayonets. Maybe not everyone is familiar with that historical fact, but the French government sent protecting troops to protect the Vatican from Victor Emmanuel when he took away the papal states of the Pope and made Italy a republic. And these French protecting troops were there to protect the papacy of uh, the Italian mob. And these protective troops were taken away in 1866. That's four years before the Council, uh, Vatican Council, where the infallibility of the Pope was pronounced. And therefore, the papacy was, quote-unquote, naked. It was without uh, protection. 
and there are many people who see this as the end of the 1260 year reign of Antichrist assuming that it didn't start in 538 as we have the Seventh Day Adventist teaching for, to 1798 when General Berthier came by Napoleon into Rome and took the Rome captive but when you start in 606 when Emperor Phocas gave the Pope uh, not only uh, temporal but uh, most of all spiritual power over the Eastern and the Western Church at the same time so the complete um, ecclesiastical or spiritual power that was in 606 and from there 1260 days you count and you come to 1866 and in 1866 these German troops uh, these French troops were um, taken out of Rome and there is a book that I have uh, that is about the German unity and uh, the late 19th century and there is the quote in that this protective troops were taken away and R.W. Thompson just makes this point that uh, the Pope should be held upon his throne by French bayonets so it were only these protecting French bayonets these French troops that were keeping the Pope in power at the time of rebellion at the time so that's why I just wanted to interfere here and give you a little bit well, more background on may, that may, may i give a little bit more background even oh, sure tom well the pope Pius IX was the one who said i am pope nowhere in the world but the united states of america and it was during this time when the papal states had been taken away from the papacy and and italy had been given a republic and the pope was losing his temporal power uh, in droves he was losing all of his power there were vast numbers of Roman Catholics in this country ready to go to Italy and fight as mercenaries for the Pope to reestablish his temporal and spiritual power in Italy and to overthrow Victor Emmanuel. And the author of this book uh, suggests that if they're willing to go to war at, at their own expense, leave this country and go to Italy to reestablish the papacy's sovereignty in Italy, wouldn't they do the same in this country? And it woke up a lot of Protestant eyes and opened a lot of dead and dying Protestant ears. They demonstrated what they were willing to do for the Pope in Italy and there was nothing but delusion to think that they wouldn't do the same thing in this country and that's why Pope Pius IX said I am Pope nowhere in the world but in the United States of America because they were ready to do whatever they had to do to reestablish papal supremacy in Italy and you've got to know as much as they profess to love the government of by and for the people in this country a government that they many of them fought and died for they would again go to war to overthrow this government to make the Pope King of Kings and Lord of Lords in this country and that's where we are today back to you Yerk okay let's just go further to what you've said I think I or I hope I made my point and that people understand that because you know not many people have that historical understanding and it is always important to put the history in uh, light of the Bible prophecy of course to understand both of them correctly so let's continue that the papal government was oppressive has been settled by the Italian people hitherto the most devout Roman Catholics in the world by their act that fact as such is entitled to a place in history and that they were justified in it as we were justified in our revolution a brief recital of facts will abundantly show the papal states during the pope's temporal dominion were held as religious property as an ecclesiastical benefice and now we come into the part which i found so important on the roman catholic socialist agenda What's coming from this moment on, what Tom reads and discusses from here on, 
is to the point in that agenda. Think of that and keep in mind what Tom said earlier, Klaus Schwab's saying, you will own nothing and be happy. The people were considered to be so many tenants who occupied and enjoyed the estate on, quote, the condition affixed by the infallible head of the church for her welfare and not for their own, unquote. They possessed no civil rights, whatever. Now, as I'm reading this, the condition of the state of affairs in the papal states, when, when the Pope's rule was unquestioned, the conditions that existed in the papal states when the Pope ruled supreme both as priest and as king, stop and think. This is the very state of affairs, the very condition of the world that will exist when the Pope has that same authority over the entire world and not just the papal states. And then ask yourself as I'm reading, how much of this already exists? And I may from time to time even give you examples as we go along. The papal states during the Pope's temporal dominion, were held as religious property. Okay? So if the Pope claims global authority as the global King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he will hold the property of the earth as religious property. Okay? You following along this example? He's going to hold the world as an ecclesiastical benefice. Okay? It says the people in the papal states at that time, but think on a global, sta uh, a global level now, the people were considered as so many tenants. Okay, In other words, they didn't own any property. They couldn't own any private property. Any, just ring any bells with any of my, my listeners, anybody who's researching this, anybody who's read Caritas and Veritate, Anybody who's read the book Ecclesiastical Megamo uh, Megalomania and some of the other books that are out on this subject, anybody who's read any of the other papal bulls, there's not going to be any private property. The Pope owns it all. Okay? The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. He's taking the place of God on earth. All right? In the papal states, that microcosm of the New World Order macrocosm, the people were just tenants. They had no private property. The people were considered as so many tenants who occupied and enjoyed the estate on, quote, the condition affixed by the infallible head of the church for her welfare and not their own. Unquote. So the people who existed in the papal states were the, for the benefit of the church. Okay? They enjoyed the papal states not for their own benefit, but for the benefit of the church. The church owned the papal states. The church ruled the papal states spiritually and temporally, and they were for the benefit of the church. The people were just tenants there. Now, they possessed no civil rights whatever in the sense in which the world holds them, but only such privileges as their sovereign, the Pope, thought proper to confer upon them. And these could be changed, modified, or wholly withdrawn at his personal discretion or whenever the interests of the church should require it. Okay, that's the state of affairs in the papal states, but don't forget to make the, the equation fit to the macrocosm. Okay, the new world, in the new world order, the people will possess no civil rights whatever, in the sense that the world holds them, but only such privileges, privileges, remember, Privileges can be taken away or altered or removed altogether. It says they possess no civil rights, whatever, 
in the sense in which the world holds them, but only such privileges as their sovereign, the Pope, thought proper to confer upon them. And these could be changed, modified, and wholly withdrawn at his personal discretion, or whenever the interest of the Roman Catholic Church would require it. Now, how would that fit in the United States? Well, first of all, you have to completely eliminate the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Okay? If the Pope is going to confer uh, your privileges, uh, whether it be by license or by decree, that's how you will enjoy your privileges. And if the Pope decides that the church would benefit if you no longer had those privileges, then he can simply alter the privilege or take them away. Now you maybe have an idea what 9-11 and the following time was all about. That's right, the Patriot Act. And I think, Tom, you will even make the point a little bit later in this broadcast. I'm not sure, but people should really think of what 9-11 was really about and the taking away of all the freedoms and the laws in the meantime. This is so important. And R.W. Thompson saw this in 1876 for crying out loud. He sure did. <clears throat> That's the New World Order. And it's even spelled out in clandestine language within the most recent papal encyclicals. Continue, it says, If the government was a trust held alone for the benefit of the church, as papists allege, then the people had no right to demand of it anything on their own account. The government was conducted wholly without reference to the people, and they were required to submit to whatever it did and to all the laws proclaimed by the papacy. Popular liberty was therefore unknown and was impossible. The papacy alone was free to do as it pleased and this was called the freedom of the church. Remember, the Pope is the church. So if the Pope is free to do whatever he pleases, that is the definition of the freedom of the church. Freedom of the Pope. Okay? The people, having thus no voice in public affairs, were in a condition of vassalage. Okay? That's the New World Order, global vassalage. The government, was a revi- uh, the government was a revival, with slight exceptions, of the old system of feudalism without its redeeming features. <laughs> yeah, the papal states were ruled as a fiefdom. Okay? It had all the, the, the tenets of the old feudal system without any of its redeeming features. That's what it was like to live in the Papal States. Complete tyranny. Complete subservience to the vassaling vassalages, the, the, the vacillating will of the Pope. Okay? Now, there was no charge or prom, uh, excuse me, there was no change or promise of change. Everything moved, everything moved on in the old grooves which had been worn by centuries of papal absolutism. A writer who personally observed this says, quote, at every appeal to alienate any part of this sacred estate or to grant any privileges to its subjects on the grounds of their inherent rights, the Pope talks of Constantine and Pepin and the blessed Countess Matilda and shaking his infallible head doggedly, uh, shaking his infallible head doggedly thunders, non possumus. In other words, impossible. Okay? That's just how thorough the tyranny was in the Papal States. Now, there was no written constitution. Not even a collection of precedents from which the citizens could learn the extent or the nature of the privileges conceded to them. Okay? I once worked for an employer like that. 
There was no employee manual. The boss of the place could change the rules at a whim, prefer one employee over another. It was living hell, let me tell you. You couldn't count on anything, and favoritism ruled supreme in that place. That's the way it's going to be. That's the way it was in the papal states, and that's the way it's going to be all over the world in the New World Order. There was no written constitution, not even a collection of precedents from which the citizens could learn the extent or the nature of the privileges con uh, conceded to them. Whatever of fundamental law there was could be found only in the decrees, canons, and constitutions of councils and of the bulls and briefs of the popes published in a language which none but the educated nobility could understand. In other words, they were written in Latin. Nobody could read or understand Latin. Nobody, that is, of course, except the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. It says, ecclesiasticism absorbed all secular as well as all spiritual power. Cardinals, prelates, and priests were a privileged class and did as they pleased. On one occasion, a priest, quote, endeavored to induce a hackman to take, uh, to take him at a lower than the usual fare. In other words, this is a, this is a, a private entrepreneur uh, apparently, I don't know what a hackman is, but obviously he was going to uh, take this prelate somewhere uh, for a fee, and the prelate, this priest, endeavored to uh, pay him less than he required. Okay? It says, on one occasion, a priest, quote, endeavored to induce a hackman to take him at a lower than uh, a lower than his usual fare, unquote, and upon his refusal to do so, he was imprisoned for several weeks. Okay, that's how the priests operated in the papal states. Okay, they were the elite, and if you were driving a taxi and you were hailed down by one of these prelates of the Roman Catholic Church and your fare was so many dollars to take him across town, and he refused to pay it, you couldn't kick him out, okay? You had to take whatever he offered you at the end of the trip, all right? They were completely immune from any moral or civil law, all right? And it says, as, as late as 1851... Bertol, uh, Bertolotti, Inquisitor General of the Holy See, published a papal edict defining certain crimes to which penalties were affixed and the duties of informers. Okay? So they had their own laws, their own penal laws, and they instructed people to rat out other people. Okay? That was part of the system. And it says these included, quote, all heretics, all guilty of any acts which can be inferred a compact, express, or tacit with the devil, <laughs> all who should, quote, hinder in any manner whatever the proceedings of the office of the Holy Inquisition, all who published writings against the high priests, the sacred colleges, the superiors, ecclesiastics, or against the regular orders. That is, you couldn't say anything in writing against anybody associated with the Roman Catholic Church. And it says, all who without license retained writings and printings which contained heresies or the books of heretics. I mean, you you were <laughs> you were held in violation of these laws if you had a copy of your own Bible, okay? And it says all who have quote eaten or given to others to eat meat, eggs, or latticini, that is a milk product, on forbidden days, in contempt of the precepts of the church, unquote. Now remember, we're talking about how life was in the Papal States. What would life be like if we were all controlled by a, an infallible Pope? 
All we have to do is look at, at, at conditions as they existed in the papal states to see how, how this new world order is going to appeal to us. All right? And as encouragement to informers, it was provided that, quote, whoever fails to denounce the above criminals to the Holy Inquisitor and special delegate against heretical pravity shall be subject to excommunication. Unquote. So there's coming a time in this new world order that anybody who suspects you of heresy will be themselves threatened with excommunication and eternal damnation if they don't turn you in. In other words, turning you in will be a divine act. Giving you up to the Holy Roman Inquisition will be doing God's service. Okay? That's the way it's going to be in the New World Order. That's the way it was in the Papal States. Now, what trifling with sacred things. Under this paternal government, if a poor Italian should have written one single word against a profligate priest who might have tried to rob his home or his most of his most precious treasure, or should have been found with a, God forbid, a Protestant Bible in his house, or a history of the American Revolution, or the life of George Washington, or the Constitution of the United States, or the Declaration of Independence, he would have been arraigned before the Holy Inquisitor, punished as a criminal, shut out from the church by excommunication, and visited with the wrath of God for violating His divine commands." And this several centuries after the close of the Middle Ages, after the world has been lifted out of the darkness into the light. What a stark contrast it was. At the time after Protestantism had gained its influence in the world, what a dark, dark place the Papal States were. The old world order as it existed even after the Protestant Reformation. And now the Protestant Reformation is going to be put down and that... Yeah. Imagine... That was it. The world is the Papal States. The world, the whole world, is the Papal States today. That's enough to take your breath away. And uh, there'll be a day soon when you won't be able to trust your own mother. Because if the authorities come for you searching for a heretic and your mother protects you so they can't find you, she will be called a heretic and she will suffer the same penalties. And we've got, we've got unlimited history. An example after example after example of where mothers betrayed their own sons and daughters to the Inquisition to save their own life, to save themselves from torture from the Inquisition. You won't be able to trust your own mother, let alone your own neighbor, let alone your own spouse, let alone your own children. The world is going to be pitted against one another. And it's going to be considered a divine right to turn in anyone who violates either the church or the state in the global papal states. Literally enough to take your breath away. Back to you, Yer. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. You know, what, what baffled me the most was when you were speaking because of what was happening in the papal states, when you were speaking of the quote-unquote modern papal encyclicals like Caritas in Veritate. And uh, this is one of the underlying papers, of course, which started us doing the reading of uh, Richard Bennett. Uh, you know, uh, that paper that we started about Roman Catholic socialist, uh, socialist agenda. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and there, of course, it goes into Caritas and Veritate and Rerum Novarum of Pope Leo XIII uh, of the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century and all that stuff. 
I, I think the most important point to, to keep from this broadcast that we've just listened to is that it all is planned a long way ahead. And the things that the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab put out there today is just the same agenda as the Roman Catholic Church taught all through the centuries. It is just packed anew and many people do not have any idea what is behind organizations like the World Economic Forum and behind people like Klaus Schwab because their research ends there and they don't make the connection between religion and politics they don't make the connection between the proposed antichrist of revelation and the ruling of the pope in our time today and one of the biggest reasons why that is is because not only the seventh day adventists but they especially and all the other protestant churches have have fallen for futurism and because especially the Seventh-day Adventists teach the wrong fulfillment of the 1260 days reign of Biblical Antichrist in uh, Revelation 13 that ended in 1798. And by that they put the people to sleep, to kind of sleep. And yes, that they is, do. And that is so dangerous and this is why I am here and I'm calling that out. And in future studies, whether Tom will be with me, I, I think so, that we will do this together, otherwise I even do that alone. We will show by a renewed study of Daniel and of Paul and of John and the Revelation that these 1260 days have not ended in 1798. They have not ended in 1866. We will give you biblical proof of the real starting date and whether it is that real ending date or it is something else. Tom and I are no date setters, but we tell you that the teaching that this loss of papal power, even that uh, papal power that uh, is dealing R.W. Thompson in his book with, is just to put you off the real agenda. There was no healing of the wound in 1929 with the Lateran Treaty. That is just futurism bullshit. And I call right. it out for what it is. And in the future, in our studies, you will see how that is. But you don't have to wait for that. Just read the wonderful 1611 King James Bible. Read very, very attentive Revelation chapter 13. And I read Bibles in more than one language. And I can tell you in the King James Bible, in Revelation 13, there's one word that specifically tells you about the reign of the Antichrist that is not in any other translated Bible that I've read so far. And that is not probably in all the new Bibles. And that again is one of the reasons why I think it is so evident that you have a correct Bible in your hand, even though the King James is not the 100% perfect Bible, as I understand so far, but it is the most correct Bible that you can get, and you should read that. That is where I want to end this with, and I hope that you enjoyed this broadcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening to Tom doing the reading of R.W. Thompson's book. I will put that book up on myarchive.org. So when you go there and you find that link in the description box of this video, you can go and you can download that book for free. You can order that book for free. There are reprints out. They cost between some, help me Tom, 80 and 30 bucks something. Something. Yeah, you know, that you can get that book today. Read it for yourself. Study it for yourself and see how betrayed you were. I tell you that wherever you go and you go somewhere where someone parrots just what everyone else parrots, I tell you that is not the truth, most likely. Just find out, be spiritually guided by the Holy Ghost, read your Bible and do a study of real historicism and real history with the help of books like that from R.W. Thompson and with the readings of Tom that I will put up on my other channel from, I think, uh, later this year, I think it is somewhere in, in July or August, will start when Cold World Babylon is done. And the link 
of the playlist will be included in this description so you can find it you can save it and you can open it when the videos come out you can subscribe to the channel so you will get an information there are two videos being published every week so that you can get them and watch them and comment on them and learn on them tom finally i want to thank you for your endless effort through all these years to for all reading this stuff and most and for all with an understanding that is so sublime that 10 20 years ago you read books of 150 200 years ago and you saw what is coming now and even in the future and you saw that coming not because you are a prophet but you saw that coming because you understand the bible you understand prophecy you understand history and you understand and teach historicism thank you for that and now I leave it for a closing remark to you, Tom. Well, thank you very much for the accolades, but uh, I want to leave the listeners with a thought. What we've been showing you is what life was like in the Papal States in Italy. A slice of land that was cut right through the center of Italy that was for the sole purpose of the Pope. He owned everything. He ruled everything. He was the sole authority. Everyone was a vassal to him, and not only that, but everyone was a, 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 an informant for the Pope. And I've described to you that the New World Order is simply the Papal States on a global scale. The whole world is now the Papal States. And I'm now going to talk to you about that informant that is going to be the, uh, a responsibility and a duty of every tenant in the global New World Order. You're going to be required to rat on your neighbor. And I'm going to tell you, the building blocks for that global information system is already in place this, this, this at the time we speak. And many of my listeners, many of the listeners of this program are going to find themselves already enrolled in that system. It's called Neighborhood Watch. How many of the listeners are, are informants in Neighborhood Watch that appears for all intents and purposes to be a benevolent system of neighborhood protection? It's going to be slowly but surely converted into that very system that we talked about in the Papal States where it is a divine prerogative to rat out your neighbor to save your own life. It begins with Neighborhood Watch. Do you still want to belong to Neighborhood Watch? I'll let you answer that question. See you next time.